Hello, hello, hello. Are we ready? So I'm here because Helen Brunson can't be. So I'm doing my best Helen Brunson impression today. And uh, Ian's here because Lucy Murphy can't be. And he's doing his best Lucy Murphy impression. Yeah. So, um, be interesting, won't it? <laughs> <laughs> Um, right, I was, genuinely, I was genuinely and generously <laughs> described by C21 a few years ago in 2016 as an industry veteran, so God knows what they call me now. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we get started, uh, we've got to say a huge thank you to our sponsors for this session, Animation UK. Yay. The CMC depends on all our sponsors to be able to deliver the conference, so we wouldn't be able to do it without them. So thank you to Animation UK for your continued support. Oh, and Kate's not here either, because she's got the COVID. Bit of a drag. Um, so uh, I've done the thanks. Right, here we are all then for the uh, Animation Assembles. Uh, anatomy of a hit. I hope you've all had a great few days here at CMC. Uh, it was, uh, it's, it's great that... Uh, we get to see, uh, we've, got a, we've got a good chunk of the animation community here today uh, to find out how this lot have been responsible for, a, for an array of brilliant talent, so uh, a brilliant content. So let me first introduce our excellent panel. So we've got Julian Bashford here. Uh, he's the creator and exec producer of Boo Snoo. Yes, <laughs> which has just started its second series on Sky Kid. It's an incredible show, and if you've had the chance to see it yet, but it's, it's a co-production with the geniuses at McKinnon and Saunders with amazing CG by Studio Liddell. Uh, it's a delight to the autistic uh, audience specifically, but, and it, and it hypnotises the rest of us. Mm. Um, and Ian France is commissioning editor at Sky Kids. He's doing his best Lucy Murphy impression today. Uh, she's not feeling great, so she's gone home. So uh, you, some might say, uh, might, some might be bold enough to say that Ian, Lucy, and their small but perfectly formed team do public service better than public service. <laughs> it's undeniable that Sky Kids has an impressive offer of great content. So thanks for joining us today, Ian. Thank you. Emma Hardy Hello. <laughs> is on the board of directors at the Mighty Aardman uh, and is an exec, uh, executive commercial and brand director. Emma's responsible for the commercial, distribution, licensing, marketing and brand partnerships across the company. So not much then, Emma. It's good to know. Thanks for that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Laura... Henry Allen is an award-winning international storyteller, producer, consultant, and educationalist. Laura is creator of the brilliant Jojo and Grand Grand. <laughs> and has a new series in development, as well as a new book, Mar Mar Marley and uh, Maya and Marley, sorry, coming out in the autumn in September, right? Yeah, correct. Right. Uh, and on the end there, we've got Adam Shaw, who's one of the original three behind Blue Zoo. Blue Zoo. Whee! Thank you. One of the UK's best animation companies. Adam is the creative force behind the excellent long-form production work. That's right, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. And he's an award-winning director with just the 24 years' experience. He's a newbie. So, a round of applause for our hey, panel, please. <laughs> so we, sh we showed the show reel at the beginning there just because we've got so much to chat about. So, uh, forgive us for not stopping to look at show reels. So, Julian, Emma, Adam and Laura, this is for you. Starting out with a seed of an idea, the development process is notoriously long and difficult. Reflected across the range of shows, what was it about your show that made you really want to stick with it and get it on the screen? And he stares at me. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so, Boo Snow, you wouldn't have seen it on the, on the uh, show reel there, but Boo Snow, if you've seen a show on any other clips here that are a little red ball, 
That's the one we're talking about. And it's, it's, um, it's a show that is all about calming uh, busy minds. And when uh, our eldest kid was, was young, uh, we used things like Thomas the Tank Engine and Baby Einstein and various other tools to calm him down. Only in situations where it was very noisy. Apart from that, loving, hilarious young lad, but noisy situations, vehicles, all that kind of stuff, it was a challenge. And, uh, and we discovered these tools to, um, to help him. Later on in life, I was thinking and developing other kids' stuff as well, and I was thinking to myself, where is an on-demand version of that type of tool? So I was thinking about the things that are, are useful for, for those types of children, and it's, it's mechanics, it's, it's, it's tracks, it's, it's not having complicated narratives or stories or words. And so Boosnu came out of that. And the thing that really drove it on for me is the fact that it should be available as two things. One is a periodic reset, something that you can just do with your family every day at a certain time. But when you desperately need it, I had an email from a, a mum yesterday emailing me at 3.30 in the morning saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. Our child's just gone to sleep <laughs> at 3.30. Thank you for making the show because we couldn't get him to sleep. Boost knew, did that. And, uh, and so it's an on-demand tool as well as something that's scheduled. And it was driving that availability of a tool that parents would then feel they, they, they have the confidence in that to, to call on. It is ultimately, though, an entertainment. And we found that people just enjoy it. And so, you know, as we started developing it, we were really enjoying it as well. So aside from what it can do for you, it's just fun. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and hypnotic. It really and hypnotic, yeah. yeah. You can't st once you start watching an episode, you're, you're there. And um, sound design is a massive part of it. Sound, sound is, is key. We've got Sandy down here, and, and um, Simon of Fuse Post did the, the sound. And, um, and one of the things with the sound is that we wanted something that's kind of like ASMR, but not slavishly ASMR. But we, there was a particular moment in the third episode, which is Trains, which, um, which is where Sky really come in, because they were, they were very, very keen to, to have the, what is the formula of Boost New? And there was a moment where it was just a little bit too noisy when we've got a lovely Art Deco train, uh, crane that's lifting our little red ball from one track to another one. And it had music over the top and all that kind of stuff. And it's a very brave person that goes to Sandy and says, Sandy, get rid of your music. <coughs> get rid of it. And we got rid of it, and we just went down to and little sounds, little sound effects. Sorry for the sound effects. <laughs> little sound effects and little ticks and, and cranks and things. And you find the audience leans in a little bit, and then... Sky basically we came do back that all it. the time, actually. We, we're always going, can you go the... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then, tick, 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 tick. How do you yeah. spell it? How yeah. do you spell it? Yeah, yeah. And, um, more of that. And so, by reducing and so the, the music, it was just... Uh, it, it was more exciting, actually, weirdly, wasn't it? It was. When you what? actually watch clips of, of kids watching those particular moments, they kind of just all lean in a little bit. And even mm -hmm. when we're mixing it, you know, we all, with, with Sandy and Simon and co, we all lean into the, the screen, waiting. And then sometimes it's a bit longer than you actually think that you would do, like 10, 15 seconds mm -hmm. without music just the sound effects, and when the music comes in again, it's like a release, a, a, mm. it's lovely, but, um, but you don't lose the audience if you get rid of all that. Yeah. You, you just calm everything down, mm. but the sound is, is lovely, and uh, I, I would spoil everything if I told you how the sounds were made, but fruit bowls may have been involved. <laughs> <laughs> have you got anything to add to that? I mean, can yeah. you remember the question? <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, for a relatively big studio, we actually have quite a small slate, so really focusing, rather than having lots of top lines, going really deep on a few ideas. So getting that character, that story, but also a sort of, I guess, a certainty of vision, so that when you do then pitch, you know, you've got a real clarity on what the show is. Um, and I think that is, I mean, the analogy of an iceberg is slightly there, you know, you've got, you've got your one pager at the, above the water, but actually you've done all of that work underneath um, to hopefully speed conversation along. But Very Small Creatures was actually a fairly swift you know, conversation was inspired by Morph um, series, and Lucy Azar took those characters and kind of gave them a life and a character of their own, but the, the environment was already quite well defined, and then it was just taking that character on um, another level, but really thinking it through so that that, you know, that next conversation was, was hopefully as, as speedy as it can be. I get that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Laura, can you tell us a bit about your journey? Um, so basically, I started off in education, so my journey was as an early years teacher, and then the last 22 years or so, I've been a consultant, writer, working with different brands, and um, my grandmother died in 2009, 
And then in grief, I was remembering all the stories that she told me when I was a grown up about how I was as a little girl and different activities and things she used to do with myself and my siblings. And I thought to myself, oh, well, I'm an early years teacher. Maybe there's an idea here about a show with a little girl and her, her grandmother. And I actually, when I was doing some consultancy work in the nursery, I freestyled the, the story. And the chil then we were just talking about the different names that children call their grandparents, like in Italy, it's Nonna, um, all these different types of names. And I thought maybe I'll start, I'll write a book, um, but what will I call the book? And I thought, oh, I didn't have to reach too far. My middle name is Josephine, hence Jojo. <laughs> So there wasn't a lot of creative thinking <laughs> in that. And then Jojo and Grand Grand, it started from that. And then I self-published the book, took the idea to the BBC, and there were a few no's. And then the lovely Ross, I can see, was at the back. <laughs> Ross actually, with her tenacity, she really believed. And I think if you get somebody in a production company or a commissioner who believes in the idea, I think we still had a few no's, but Ros kept on, she was sending me emails, I'm going to go. <laughs> and um, I can see she's nodding at the back. The lights are <laughs> blinding me up here, actually. <laughs> and, um, and then I think when it was commissioned, it was, it's about time. And that's the reason why, if you, any of the Jojo and Grand Grand fans, it's in season. And so I always give thanks to having somebody like Ross who championed the idea who's an expert, who's just really good at what she does. Roj needs to be up here, actually, as well, <laughs> to talk about Jojo and Grand Grand. And I always say it's not me. There was uh, hundreds of people who worked on the show. And yes, it's really good around the diversity because it's showing a black family and a St. Lucian family. I'm from St. Lucia. Everybody must go to St. Lucia in the audience. <laughs> it's a lovely country. <laughs> and all the different activities. So when I go into schools and people say, oh, I made a, a bird feeder in lockdown. Everybody made banana bread. So there's, with my education hat on, what the team really worked on was the educational aspect of it. And it's when Jojo and Grand Grand first came out four years ago, just before we hit lockdown, and, you know, we were getting emails and messages, you know, from black and brown parents saying, oh, wow, you know, I'm in tears seeing this. We never had this when I was a child. And I always say that showing content, children's content, that deals with a particular community or a particular subject, it's not just for that community. There's some research from America, Dr. Rudin Bishop. Her research focuses more on children's books, but we can use it for children's TV. And um, it's mirrors, windows, and sliding doors. So the mirrors is, is that children can see themselves in the books. And then the windows is children can look in and see differences. And then the sliding doors is to step into that and then look at the similarities and differences and use that as a, um, as a conversation piece, as it were. So I just yeah. feel that you know, content for everybody. And I always say, let's not just be one and done. We've had one black children's TV show. Let's have some more, because it is yeah. super important yeah. that, you know, we're all children are part of this global village. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Adam, what do you think? Well, I, <clears throat> we've been in a fortunate position at Blue Zoo to have created a few of our own IPs. Yeah. Um, and for us, it's always been kind of having the right projects, having that right partner at the right time, and it's kind of these things coming together which kind of make, can make it happen. Kind of going back to like our first foray into creating IP, and that was like for the, those scurvy rascals, which was something which we created probably about 20 years ago. Um, and on that, we we're working with Nickelodeon for some, you know, some on-air, we're doing some on-air work for them. and. Uh, I think it was Ollie kind of had the idea of like this simple concept of pirates that didn't want to steal gold or treasure. They just wanted underpants. <laughs> just get it really simple. We kind of pitched it in as an interstitial, you know, three or five minute the first pilot. And uh, it went down great. 
and uh, and so you know, so we got a little license fee for doing that. You know, obviously, you kind of all the time, kind of making, you know, there's there's more costs than being able to, you know, like you're getting in a license fee for one off. Um, but then we kind of managed to get, you know, a few more episodes kind of within that. Um, and uh, and as part of this story, it was kind of like to be able to to fund that series. We had to, you know, it's like we sold, we sold all the rights in it, but we just wanted to make something, and it's like get our first step on that ladder, yeah. and that was that was the most important thing for us because, you know, like you can hold on for something so much, thinking this is going to be the big big hit, yeah. when kind of really it's about it's about making the content it's and getting it. Stepping for carrying on. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And Ian, what's what is it about? Um, an idea that makes you think, ah, oh, I've got to get involved with that one. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously, on a surface level, we're all creatives, and when you see an amazing idea come in and you get really excited by it, we're very excited with Boost New. When Boost New, we, we, we got very excited by that. Um, and also, uh, Ready, Eddie, Go, which is uh, on Sky Kids, because they were both very, very unique, and I think that's something that we're always striving for at Sky Kids. We want premium-looking animation, um, but I also think that there's so many commissioning considerations every stage. We know if an idea is brilliant, but what we've got to also look at is, because mm -hmm. if you can imagine Sky Kids content is on Sky Glass, Sky Stream, uh, it's on Now TV, it's on lots of different homes, on lots of different platforms around the UK. And of course, it shows the best of the UK. So when you switch on Sky Kids, you can see everyone's work. Um, the iPlayer goes on it, you know, Sky Kids. Um, we've got our, our partners as well. You know, you see some amazing content from, um, you know, Nick Jr. and uh, Cartoon Network, Boomerang, Cartoon Eto, Nickelodeon. It's all there. Um, so what we try to do at Sky Kids is we don't try and compete. We just want to make distinctive content that looks different when you go onto that UI. So when you go on the UI, you can see it's very, very different, and we're not trying to, you know, kind of have similar content to other Duplicate. other people. And you know, we see a lot of ideas that come in, and there's a. I'm being really honest here. There's lots of ideas that do look like other cartoons, and that that can be a problem because you you look at it and you go, it's it's a great idea, but it looks like that show or it looks like this show. And so, the more distinctive you can make your idea with a distinctive hook and a distinctive look. Wow, that's a nice little there. Uh, Whoa. Mm. Hey. It's <laughs> it. Never said that before in my life. Um, <laughs> but I think that anything, that. Like, anything like that is going to be better than things that look like other things, I think. So that's, that's what we always look at. We have a big discussion about it. And I think Ready, Eddie, Go did that. Boost New did that. Um, totally. And loads of other animations that we've, we've commissioned, you know, because we want that distinctiveness to look, and it to look different. Mm. So, um, Laura and Adam, we need to crack on here. Look, we've got 10 to <laughs> 1 already. Um, so, um, can you share some insights into the balance between humour, emotion, and educational content in the children's animation and how it contributes to your success? Go for it. Over to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think if I put my educational hat on, if I'm thinking around Jojo and Grand Grand, what the team created, you know, I just planted this small seed, but the wider team on the show is that, you know, the number of different extension activities, those learning points. For instance, in the episode, we're told, one of the episodes, they make Callaloo soup. And so for some children, that may be their first introduction. So I think sometimes similarity is, is good, but I think when we're talking about children's TV, is our children able to, to learn from that um, in terms of pick up new words, new concepts, find out about you know, differences? And then equally to, you've got to be thinking about the, the humour within shows. Yeah. And then because I go into a lot of schools, I, um, I deliver authors visits and you cannot, that's my first research point when I test ideas out on children, I start freestyling and you can see, you know, are they counting the hairs on their arms or are they, you know, um, are they laughing out loud, do they get giggly and you, can, you pick that up and you think, okay, that's going to be a, you know, a particular funny idea and equally too, I do consultancy work on other shows and I can see when I'm looking at scripts 
and I have a smile on my face, and I think, yeah, that's going to be, I can see when it's animated, it's going to be super funny. It's the way in, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. exactly, absolutely. Yeah. But I think in terms of what Ian was saying, it's about then something that is unique and about, I think, being brave as well, mm. if you are yep, a creator. Yep. What about you, Adam? What do you think about this? I'd, I'd say it's, um, it's important to know what the objective of that show is. That if it's, uh, you know, if it's pure entertainment show, then, then I think just tacking on the top of it some, you know, some, a sprinkling of education isn't really adding the value. Okay. But so like, if you're making an educational show or you, you, like, you, you are, I say that, but then as soon as you say educational show, you kind of say, oh, oh it's worthy, it's less commercial, harder to get the funding to together. Yeah. But sort of like, you know, like if you are, say, like, you know, like, you know, like we're having success with our blocks brands. And on that, like the first thing that we do is set up the curriculum for, for it. it. It is an educational show, but it's kind of, it's, it's right at the beginning, understanding what that curriculum is, not trying to cram so much in. But most of the time, we, you know, sort of like we're planning it out and then we end up having to cut it in half to be able to give everything time and be able to let... Let the breathe. stories, yeah, let it breathe. Let the stories kind of do the work. Let, let the characters um, kind of sort of shine through that. Um, and really getting that pedagogy right. Yes, I said it. <laughs> 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 um, and, then, and, then, and then having a fantastic writing team that, that, are, that are bringing those characters and that humour to life. So you've got that full engagement. You know you've hit it if the children, if the children are learning without thinking that they are learning yeah. Yeah. and then it yeah. and then it's probably enriching you know yeah. it's totally yeah. we um obviously at Arvin we've been making a lot of ads as well as films and series for 30 years and we've just been doing some research with system one that shows uh, the science is there that if you know, if you're entertained if there's comedy you're more likely to remember the message yeah. or you know the point that's being conveyed so actually mm. you know it's a great uh, tool as well mm. for kind of helping to bring those those messages yeah home Cool. So, Ian, is there any, are there any specific challenges and opportunities creating uh, unique animated content for, for children? No, not really. I mean, when you talk about unique, um, I think we can go into the world of whether it's IP, known IP or not. That's always the big discussion, isn't it? But we've, I think we're, we've made a really good hit of Boost New and Ready Eddie Go, like I say. But at the same time, we are incredibly proud of the brilliant world of Tom Gates as well. Mm. So we've, we've got a really good balance of, of known IP, but we also, you know, we take a punt on new stuff if, if we think it's going to be really um, exciting for kids to watch and, it, and there's a purpose for it. Like, like Adam was saying about, you know, it's got to have a purpose when we commission it. And what, what's the point of it? What's it going to be doing there? Is it educational or not? But, um, but no, I think that, you know, I think when you've got the right idea, the, there's... there's the challenge really, as I say, is just making it unique, making it, making it look different. Um, and I suppose you've got a challenge to get it out there with discoverability. That's always going to be something that's going to be a really big issue. Yeah, because like Rap yeah. Tales is a great show. I mean, it's not really managed to cut yeah. through, is it? Yeah. Well, no, I think it, if it, it has in our Sky world. Right. Um, it's behind a paywall, of course, because yeah. it's Sky. But I think that... Um, but I think when you look at rap tales and people have reported back, they've you know when they watch it and they've really really enjoyed yeah, it. It's great. And the other MC grammar animation stuff that we've done as well. But I think that discoverability will always be. A, it, it's getting it's getting busier out there, isn't it? Yeah. And I think it's just making sure that there's a strategy about who's going to watch your animation and who's and where it's going to go and why and anything you can do with the animation that gives it an extra gloss as well. For example, with Happy Town, which is a series that launches on Sky Kids next year. Um, we've got Mel B from the Spice Girls as the voiceover on it. And, you know, and, and getting Mel B was really interesting. You know, it's like, do, what, what do you want me to do? And uh, we're having, <laughs> having a good chat with Mel B about it. And she really engaged in it and loved it. And her, she loves doing the voiceovers for it. And when that launches next year, I think that people will love it because you can tell that she's got a really sense of, you know, she, she knows all the characters and she's, she, you know, when she does that voiceover, there's a lot of love with it. Yeah. Um, and of course, that's extra publicity about the animation when it goes out, isn't it? Right, because yeah, parents so, it, so really think about the extras around the animation as well and how the message is getting out there and where it's going to go, how they're going to find it, who's in it. Um, all those things have to be a factor too um, to get the message out there. So that's, that's the challenge, I think. Yeah. So Julian, what specific techniques or artistic choices did you employ 
to make your recent hit with Boost yeah. uh, strikingly striking and memorable. Far bit for me to be controversial here, <laughs> but a lot of Boost News started out as live action. Sorry, I know it's anime. Yeah. But, um, but the thing with the, with the target audience and the subject matter is that you wanted to have the sensory element. And when you've got f things that are fluffy and furry and squidgy and splodgy and all that kind of stuff, you do need to have some, some tactile materials. And then when, we, when Sky came on board, I remember very clearly the discussion that we had where they basically said, make it look polished. Make it look really amazing. And at that point, the CG incorporation really dramatically went up because we wanted to world build something that around the around the live action that we had, that, um, that made it look like just, you can't tell the join where the live and the, the CG and there's some stop motion and there's various, there's all sorts of techniques yeah. employed in there. Can, so I, answer, can I say, yeah. I, I know I sound really unprofessional at this moment, but I often have to say, I say to Tracy, um, when, I, when we get a boost new episode and I go, is that bit, is that bit real? <laughs> <laughs> I go, is that, bit, is that bit real or is that, is that like CG? And Tracy goes, no, that bit CG. Oh, oh God, okay. And then, and then I, and I, and I know Is she that. telling the it's, truth there's a, there's a brilliant, there's, there's like a wooden, <laughs> there is a wooden maze that's CG in Boost New and I'm like, that isn't CG, that's amazing. <laughs> but sorry, carry on. <laughs> well, it, and, and it's, um, it's about making that confusion. And really what you want to do is you want children to watch it and just not think I'm watching an animated show or I'm watching yeah. a live show. They want to, they say, I'm watching a Boost New show. Yeah. And, um, and that's really, really worked. And so what, on one design thing that really is important to us, there is no character as such. There's no face or story. It's a red ball. But what, what it means is that the red ball is always in shot and always starts from there and always ends up there. And there's, there's a formula to how it all works. Because if you've got our specific type of audience that we're initially targeting, there's a formula that they like it to follow and sections are always the same length. It's very repeated bits, are always the, the, the right length. But something that's interesting with Sky is they have their, their EPG, what I see at home is the Sky Cube box. And each one of the hero images, the EPG images, has the ball very clearly. And so the identity of the show has been very clearly forged and you can see any of the shots, or in fact any single freeze frame of, of the entire show and you know what it is <laughs> because it's always there front and center. So well, Adam, how do you approach character design and development to uh, create relatable characters for children? I think, I think what's crucial is that they've just got that appeal, so, you know, because the audience have to love, love those characters. They want to spend time with them. You want the children to spend as much time with your characters as well, but they, you know, so they, it, it's, it, like they've really got to be loved, so they've got to have that, that connection. They've got to understand, you know, I'm going to talk about emotion here. I'm sure there's lots of emotion <laughs> in a, like in the Red Bull, but like kind of when looking at the characters, say like with, you know, like with Paddington, it's kind of how do, how do we ensure in this version of it that the children can fully understand, you know, sort of the emotion that he's emoting and like to use, to use everything that you've got. So like for us, it's kind of a, you know, so sort of often when you're converting kind of from books, it might be something which is right for a book needs to develop a little bit further because like the, the use of brows is, is, is a huge thing for understanding motion. The eyes often like there's dot eyes and things like that, but how do you, how do you get like more, more emotion in across from that, um, like, you know, Paddington character, although they are black dots that we do have, like, you know, sort of the whites of the irises, so you can kind, you, you can see it, um, uh, you can see Paddington thinking so much easier, you can see eye direction, and we get the iris in there just to pull, you know, sort of pull the uh, audience in. So it's all about understanding what he's thinking. Um, and then also, you know, often on characters, if there's hidden mouths, again, you want to be able to see if they're smiling and, and that type of thing. So um, it's kind of, it, it's working hard, especially if you're dealing with some like elephants where you've got trunks and things like that, do you know what I mean? Because you want, you want all the key facial features to be able to read, read really um, easily. Um, but also there's a uniqueness, and I think this was picked up kind of earlier. You want it to be different, not not necessarily so different it's weird and it's not going to have that appeal, mm. but different that you know it's definitely, uh, you know, sort of from that show that that's that character. It's just not another one of those other shows that you might have seen before. Mm. Um, and the way I think about that is if you're, 
if your child's going to school on World Book Day and they were mm -hmm. making up, or like you were helping making up a costume of them, you know, sort of like, can, they, can you send them in? And people will say, I know who that character is. Yeah. And it's because it's got these very clear mm -hmm. colorings, do you know what I mean? Kind of shapes and things like that. And it's kind of, that's, that's just a, a, a simple rule that I kind of often use. Yeah. Very, very, very specific. So, Laura, many animated hits have, have had messages or moral lessons Im embedded within. How do you um, incorporate meaningful themes into your stories without being too didactic? Um, what am I going to say? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so the, I've got another show that I'm developing. It's called Daddy O and Co, and that centres on... The, the dad's in the title. He's a black dad, and he's just a positive role model. And the, there's two children um, in, the, in that particular show as well. And one of the children, they've got autism. But for me, it was important for the audience not to pity the character, so you can see them in that multi-dimensional way. And I think I get your point. Would you wear your show on a T-shirt, <laughs> you know, and dress up as it in World Book Day? But I think it's about showing the, the, the content in a way that's fun and it's relatable content, because everything that I do, whether or not it's um, writing a children's book or creating... Um, a children's TV show, it all comes back to families and my lived experience. You know, Freud would have a field day on me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, to me, that's, that's what's important. And I can really run with that because I am talking... Um, Adio and Co is my family with my son who is, you know, autistic. And the stories that I've all that I've created within that are just day-to-day -day family shows. So it's a switch on um, sort of he's not a stay-at-home dad because he actually works as as a journalist, but he does most of the the caring. Yeah. The autism is there slightly because we're showing the Lewis as being problem solving as a strength. Do you see what I mean? If that mm. makes yeah, sense. Yeah. And that's what I think is 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 super important that children see that on the on the screen. So there is a message there, but it's fun, it's learning, there's comedy in there, etc. Yeah, and the kid just happens to be autistic. Right? Yes, yeah. yeah exactly. You were saying something so along the similar lines when we were chatting earlier, weren't it's, you? About? It's um it's a challenge, but when you when you are showing when you're putting together a show to look, we talked about um, Ready Eddie Go, mm. but um, to have a show that has an autistic character, you don't want that show to have a, a horrible, inaccessible, unpleasant, or whatever situation. You want the child to be appealing and and funny and all those kind of things. It's very difficult to have um, you're showing the challenges of, of the, that the, the child has, but you want to show the positives mm. and um, and getting that balance right. I, I, I couldn't do it. I think it's it's very tricky to get mm. that a personality the, right. The, prob the problems that Eddie faces in Ready Eddie Go, he, he, every child faces. I think mm. that's what we, we try to do. So anybody that's watching will learn. Will you know as a parent as well? You learn skills as a parent by watching Ready Eddie go to see what Eddie goes through. Um, but it, but it normalises things like um, yeah. ear, um, you know, ear, def ear defenders, defenders yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Which is, that's fantastic. Yeah. Mm. That is so normalised these days, but mm. five or ten years ago, if you saw someone walking around with those on, you go, mm. yeah. they're not plugged in. What are they plugged into? Yeah, it's but definitely it's, different it's now. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But we try and appeal to everybody, so it's a, it's a kind of a kit of parts for a parent to watch. Like mm. Boost New, in a way. You, know, you put it on and it, it relaxes your, your, your child at bedtime. You know, mm. it's, we try and do that with it. But it's a well. fantastically entertaining show, irrespective of any of that. That's, yeah. that's the thing. And we, we look after it internationally. And yeah. you were saying earlier, actually, it's, you know, it's really resonated mm. as well. Kind yeah. Of the I think, I think comedy is key. I think yeah. comedy is key in that, absolutely. Because you know, when you say about, you know, Boost New, it is really funny. You know, we've all introduced yeah. the other coloured balls as well. And they all have a, they have a whale of a time. Oh, <laughs> green ball. <laughs> green, get me started. Green, ball, green ball's <laughs> cheeky. Yeah. Um, but we do, you know, but as I say, it's, it's just, it's through comedy. The, the writing on Ready, Eddie, Go is, is just awesome. I've been reading some of the new scripts for the new series and it genuinely makes you laugh. And you, it isn't really all about autism really mm. it's about the comedy through it and then you laugh and then you've learned something and then eddie's gone through it and then eddie's learned too and the narrator in ready to go helps him through that situation but you've giggled along the way and that appeals to everybody doesn't it we all it also to laugh, really helps though that it's got a really cool look 
I think the yeah. whole look to Radio Go is so that, striking. Yeah, but that goes back to discoverability and making something mm. really different. But yeah. as Adam was saying, not too weird different. You know, it's got, we understand that, but it's like it just has a different vibe yeah. and mm. looks, you know, it's that show with the ball or that show with that thing, mm. yeah. which is really important. So we're increasingly here that commissioners want content with pre built in audiences, like provenance from books and existing IP, for example. So how do you translate things? From in for, to a new, for a new medium, and in some cases, update them without losing the heart of the content. Is that me? No, it's not you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> more, more than happy. <laughs> that's, my to go. that's my day to day. No, you looked at me. That's fine. <laughs> I'm going to start with Emma. Okay, I'll hand over to you. <laughs> Thank worry. you, Emma. Um, yeah, I think, you know, we haven't done a, a huge amount of literary adaptations in the past. There's Pirates, obviously, from the Gideon Defoe novel, which was a 2012 film. But I think we're looking at more now. And it is really about, I guess, thinking, reminding yourself constantly of what brought you to that IP or that, you know, that book in the first place and carrying that, that with you, respecting kind of the original creator's vision and what kind of you know, they've brought to it, but also, you know, particularly for us thinking, why, what are we going to bring to it as Ardman? What's the added value? What's the added take? What's the sort of, uh, you know, opportunity there? And why us versus anybody else? Yeah. I think is an important question to ask yourself. Um, but it's, you know, I think there's, you know, there's an excitement certainly of some of the things we're looking at thinking, you know, a certain IP meets Ardman is a delicious combination that people might, you know, be excited to see. But we were talking earlier, you know, book IP, literary IP, gaming IP is really quite expensive for people to buy into. And you don't actually always have to do that. There's a lot of familiar arenas that give that brand recognition that will cut through noise that, you know, we're all trying to kind of break you know, head above the water, which don't cost the earth. So if you go, you know, think of, you know, King Arthur and the Round Table, Robin Hood, there are, there are lots of sort of characters or periods of history that you can tack onto to get that recognition and craft stories within them. So, you know, you've, you're bypassing that sort of um, new IP from scratch challenge. Yeah. yeah. Got anything to add to that, Adam? Yeah, I know, I, I know it's like a, it is a frustration for so many of the creatives out there at the moment, which are wanting to put forward their originals and, and, and there's this big drive, big drive for the, you know, those, uh, you know, the marketing, you know, that's already in place by having this kind of a heritage brand behind it. Um, but also, like, from from animation company's perspective as well, there is there is an opportunity there as well. And that, you know, it's like you can be working on a show that's already kind of elevated in that way. Um, and so that was something, say, like on Paddington, it was a... It was something it meant something very, very special to me. Like it was part of, I'm sure like a lot of people here, yeah. it's part of your your childhood, you know, like stories being read to you. And then sort of like I was reading the stories to my children and watching the stop motion and then the opportunity to actually animate animate that show, bring it to a new a new audience, new audience as well. Yeah. It's kind of yeah, and that and, and that's very, very special. Um and so, although although it is frustrating in some <laughs> ways, do you know what I mean? I guess I guess from that you know, like from that service service point of view, it, it is it is such a fantastic opportunity. Um, but so, like the importance is is not losing the heart. What what that special source is that kind of made it special in the first place, yeah, and introduce it in a new way to a yeah. new audience. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Have you got any thoughts on that, Laura? Um, I don't think I've got anything to add, really. Because yeah, be you honest. don't you get involved with that, yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. You right. threw me in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think with, um, with, with, with Tom Gates, we, we, the brilliant world of Tom Gates, obviously it's been a book that's been around, a series of books for a decade, and we, we, we really wanted to preserve everything about that book. We had loads of discussions with Liz Pichon, who's the, uh, the creator of Tom Gates, the illustrator. And, of course, that's black and white, drawings on a white page, isn't it, Tom Gates? So we're bringing colour to it. That was the really yeah, big... controversial. That was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was sort of wasn't, it wasn't, you know, like what colour is Tom Gates' wall in his bedroom? Because it couldn't just all be black and white. And so we're having various discussions about the colour the color patterns, the colour ways in the background of the, of the black and white imagery of the, of, the, of the characters. And that was a really interesting discussion, but we all just loved it. And we just really wanted to protect the humour 
and her writing. And Liz was involved at every step of the way with um, Wild Child, who are, who are just amazing. And they, were, they worked really closely with Liz to make sure that it did match the books as much as possible. Um, but we still had loads of fun with it as well. You know, we had the, the gags just grew and you know, there's some funny things that we created. We, we started making it during COVID. So Liz herself was in the, in the show um, doing art and design because we didn't know how to, how are we going to make this animation when we're all at home, you know? So it was a really interesting start Tom Gates had. But now it's in its third series and it's really, it's grown and we're, you know, and it still remains true to the books, really. Same with Isadora Moon, you know, that's something on Sky Kids and that's, we've remained true to the books and now we've announced that Emerald, who is um, Isadora's uh, cousin, that's going to be made now into, into a series as well. But Harriet Muncaster has done some amazing books and we just want to protect, mm. protect it as much as possible. We understand things are going to be different because they're moving. Um, it's animated, but just try and protect that thing why pe kids buy those books and love them and cherish them. Mm. You know, do, with you do, more, do you do more testing with it because you're yes. more sensitive about, yeah, you know what I mean, yeah. how people are going to perceive it in its new form? Yeah, absolutely. I think sometimes it's a slam dunk. And I think because we got Tom Gates, we just knew it was really, really popular. Mm. And it was popular. There's no doubt about it. And, you know, but, we, and, but, but I don't think... I don't think we tested Isadora because we just loved it and we just knew that it was in the shops and it was doing so well and it was just, it just looks beautiful. And I love the way that in the books with Isadora Moon, they're, they're different colours. So I think Emerald books are all green, Isadora Moon is, mm. is purple and, you know, and it's just, there's some really, there's some just lovely, lovely thoughts that go into it that we, do, that we have to protect. But obviously we've got to bring full colour to the animation as well. But that goes under a, a lot of scrutiny. I know Estelle looks after Isadora Moon. Um, and uh, they, both sides, the production and you know, uh, the Sky Kids, we just really care about making sure it's, it's, it's true to the original. You know. It's hard you don't want to, you know, like the pressure's on not to screw it up when it's Absolutely. an original yeah. IP. Yeah, of course. And you don't want to go out there with like a, you know, like, a Sonic Hedgehog version one. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you want yeah. to hit version two straight yeah, away. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But also the same same with the um same with the new IP as well though, when it's been when it's been pitched to us. We we've loved it for a particular reason, haven't we? And we want to try and protect that. Um but we we did make some changes to Boost yeah. We absolutely brought comedy into it, brought storytelling a bit more into it. And why we, there was loads of questions at the beginning, like why is the ball doing that, and what's the what's the point of it? And there was a lot of that at the start, wasn't it? We, we had a lot of discussion. There, yeah. there, there is the um, there's the catchphrase in, in the um, in the production. Boost now is five percent sentient. Yeah. So even though he can't control which way it rolls, <laughs> you like to think yeah. that it's having a good time. But as I it's said going to around. you at the start, I was like, <laughs> yeah, because I, I was saying, oh, so Boost News just jumped up that. He's just jumped by itself up to that thing, but that's not physics, Julian. No. And then you go, <laughs> and then you go, no, he's just a bit, a bit sentient, Ian. So basically, what he's done is he's just, he's just like rolled, and he can just jump, he can do things. But we have it. That's have not a, physics, Julian. We have Maybe a section like, which is like um, a, a right. video games episode, yeah. and um, and each of them we've got an 8-bit, a 16-bit, and a 32-bit homage. And yeah. The 32-bit one is like a temple run, so the ball rolls, but because it goes like like a kind of a one of those games, running games. But there's a little glass mount that pops it over the, the tracks and they're, they're just discreetly hidden but it means that it can run as an automaton the whole thing can run as a machine yeah. but um but we have to keep our eyes on it and ian is always there with the, with the whip sorry. to make sure we're <laughs> sorry, yeah, to make sure it all yeah. works it's got to all work you've got to feel that you can yeah. go inside the machine and watch it just go from and, the beginning and, of the episode and just the very end. quickly that just stems because ki all kids love marble runs and that's based on real physics so yeah. that's what we try and yeah. do is that we try and you know you drop the marble in it rolls round it goes up down all that and that's why kids love work. marble runs yeah. so much i think and that's why we've got to remain true to that love of that sort yeah, of thing physical yeah. thing yeah. so uh, 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 how can you bring um new life to heritage uh content uh that the audiences love without overdoing and fatiguing the audiences emma yeah we've got some we've got some good you know legacy brands i think it's, uh, it's always story first, you know, we're not going to kind of create new content for the sake of it. Um, I think we've got 170 episodes, Sean the Sheep, but that's been over 17 years. So actually that's not a lot by some of the kind of modern, you know, more higher volume series. Um, so, you know, fortunately, Stop Frame doesn't make for super speedy delivery. <laughs> so, you know, we, we, we hope that people look forward to those new series and we've got that kind of gap between 
but you know creatively i think it is all about you know what's that sort of fresh take and we you know for the last series of Shaun the sheep that we're just about to start shooting we actually did an internal call out for ideas amongst the whole studio and one of the ideas for the series has come from our consumer products licensing team you know so there's there's a there's a whole range and we work with a lot of different writers to then develop them obviously but i think you know it is about uh, it's about finding those kind of ways to tell, you know, keep the comedy fresh. We talked about comedy earlier. I mean, that's so important to everything that Ardman does. The challenge of the expression in Gromit or Sean's face with no dialogue. It's just the eyebrow. You know, that's, that's literally all that is conveying that emotion. So I think, you know, keeping that um, fresh. But we've, you know, we're lucky that we've got a lot of kind of other ways to engage with people. So while well, the series isn't, isn't on air, we've got, you know, AR trails that we partner with lots of different needs to do we've got consumer product new product line so it's sort of how can people engage with the show and the characters in different ways that doesn't as you say fatigue them and, and the content kind of stays fresh and exciting yeah yeah what a responsibility eh yeah <laughs> treasured yeah <laughs> adam any thoughts on that well, isn't isn't this like the billion dollar question? Yeah. I, I, do you know what I mean? Like we've we've got you know, <coughs> Star Wars and Marvel, and the, I think yeah. they've explored everything mm. everywhere. Um, and so it's fascinating it, it, seeing the different regional animation styles that have been brought into Star yeah. Wars, like the African or the, the mm -hmm. Far Eastern animation, and the Aardman mm -hmm. um, Star yeah. Wars as well. It's a, it's extraordinary how far you can stretch a, a, a legacy brand in all sorts of directions. But, it's like it, but then it's slightly different within like the children's, especially within preschool as well, because you've got a new audience every mm. year, every yeah, two years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's driving it often is from the commercial side yeah. of things. Then it's kind of like, what's happening? We need to go to a new place. And we need to have these new. Again, it's got to all be about the stories, mm -hmm. but often like on those repeat series. There is there is a push from kind of when's the when's the um, uh, you know sort of the bus coming into it or something like that. It's not necessarily keeping it. That's not keeping it fresh so much. What would be keeping it fresh is actually kind of looking at the character dynamics and kind of playing with mm -hmm. those stories a bit more. Yeah. But then you don't want those characters to evolve, they've got to stay in, do you know what I mean? It's always that same age of audience. So like in a way, it's kind of, it's, it's making it, it's making it for the, for the time, the now, what the children are doing now. Um, and then if it's a heritage brand, you do, I mean, I think the buzzword, this CMC is kind of sh shared experiences mm. where possible, get that shared experience. So then like, you know, the you know, the parents are enjoying it with the children. Mm. Yeah. What's quite, I mean, what's, what's a privilege, I guess, of those, those longer running brands is when you have something, an environment that you know, you know, it's quite a sort of defined arena and it's another opportunity to bring in more emerging talent, perhaps. You know, we do that with Sean the Sheep quite yeah. a lot for people to come in and, and be able to experiment, give fresh perspectives, but in an environment that is taking away some of the uncertainty, you know, of defining something entirely new. So it's quite a... Yeah, it's a nice playground from that perspective to bring new voices in, I think. Mm. Well, you can, get a, you can get loose and have more fun, but it's often kind of creating more series, you kind of get more and more comfortable about that family yeah. of characters that you've mm. got. Mm. So, it, you know, they, sh they should be getting... It should be getting more humorous. It should be getting more, you know, sort of like that you... That, yeah, you kind of like... It just... It just gets stronger. Mm. You get strong, stronger relationships. Mm. I think a spin-off's interesting. A spin-off's are very interesting yeah. as well. Like, so Morph was really popular on Sky Kids. Then we made the very small creatures, yeah. which aged it much, yeah. you know, much lower. But that's turned out to be really popular as well. So it's almost like finding the right, mm. the right spin-offs as well to keep a brand alive mm. and what that spin-off might be without being too risky. So that's yeah. It's or or Shorn's films with Farmageddon. Wallace Absolutely, yeah. yeah, from Wallace yeah. and Gromit, yeah. yeah. And then Timmy Time. So I mean, yeah. yeah. But, but you, then you've got Farmageddon. You've got all that kind of stuff that spins off as well. It's 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 a multi-pronged. Yeah, and actually, from a this is the commercial bit coming in, but from an IP perspective, if you can create characters within a show and spin them off, you're going to be in a much better position to mm -hmm. retain that IP. Yeah, yeah. Going mm. forward. We need more balls. <laughs> 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 On it. <laughs> so other than your own shows, what's what's your favourite animated hit? So my 20 and 17-year-old sons would be desperate for me to say Arcane right now because they've been trying so much to get me to love Arcane. It's astonishing, but Tweedy and Fluff. Yeah. How lovely is that? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. 
I should make more of those. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to answer for my kids as well, because it's really funny. I, I get to see more stuff through their eyes because mm -hmm. we sit down in the lounge and we just watch the telly together. But they are they're loving uh, Total Drama Island uh, and the Redunculus Race. And it's like a reality show, but it's kind of an animation that's on CBBC at the moment. And they are loving every episode. And the, and the writing is really funny. So they're enjoying in that, yeah, Total Drama Island and uh, the Redunculus Race, both of those series. Mm -hmm. And Danger Mouth. And Danger Mouse, yeah. of course, yeah, which I did, mention, I, mentioned, <laughs> I did mention to Tim earlier that... Yeah, that, that He's uh, the greatest. My, He's my, fantastic. My little yeah. boy's loving Danger Mouse at the moment as well. So, yeah. So good. Yeah. I'm going to stay in the stop frame arena and say Kiri and Lou. I love Kiri oh, and that Lou. Is lovely. Yeah. It's also, it's got that co-viewing. You know, the comedy mm. in it is so good for parents as much as the kids. We, yeah, we watch a lot of it together. Yeah. Mm, that's one. Laura? Um, when my sons were little, and I love this as well in terms of co-viewing, was Arthur. Love that, love that show. Now it would be... I'm going to share three, actually. Um, in terms of what I'm picking up, Bluey, obviously, got to drop that in there. Yeah. Co-viewing as well. Yeah. And recently, on Milkshake, um, beautiful show called Mix Mups. Oh, um, yeah. That's yeah. really, really good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, bias, I worked on it as a consultant. But, <laughs> it's really, <laughs> but it's a really, really good show. And I think we just we really need to champion it for, for many different levels as well. Yeah. I'm going nostalgia factor. I'm going Thundercats. Ooh. Oh, yeah. yeah. You got, you know, like yeah. you've got like every child's mm. kind of dream team there. Yeah. Great diverse cast, great, great action, comedy all in there. The best um, baddie in Mumra and and think of consumer products with the Thunder Tank, the the, the best vehicle. The so uh, yeah, clear winner. Right, <laughs> it's got, there's got to be a, fa a fast channel with that on it, surely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got I to think be we've one. got a few minutes for some questions if anyone's got any. So, uh, any, anyone got any questions? I think we're going to be let off lightly. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> Let's get out of here. <laughs> no. No questions. What's the matter? Come on. Yeah. Can't see. Hopefully. No. All right then. On to another one of my own then. <laughs> um, so, uh, how do you see the future of animation evolving, and what are the emerging trends that industry professionals should be aware of? So I am. I'm a creator. I'm not an animator at the coal face, <laughs> but it is fascinating watching the AI stuff, and I know that mm. if I had any opinion. I'd get rotten tomatoes thrown at me on the stage right now because it's <laughs> such. All, all I, the only thing I think of when I think of AI is will it make a better um, delivery to the kids? Mm -hmm. Will it make better product? I know there's all the conversation about employment, skills, all that kind of stuff. That's a complicated subject. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, will the kids get a product that is, it is better? Mm -hmm. And I hope the answer is yes, and I hope that we can also bring talent along with it and it just forms part of the of the mix of tools it's That's interesting on that in, sort of in that arena we've definitely there's sort of a, been a guess a pushback on it in that uh, we're finding more and more people excited about the craft of stop yeah. frame and yeah. a sort of made by humans yeah and yeah. an obsession about yeah. you know seeing that and understanding kind of the the physicality behind that and that it's real you yeah. know it seems yeah, yeah. Like i've got this theory people like to see the join you know like to see yeah. the, the, the things yeah, that yeah. Yeah. yeah but then when you see like abba voyage they put those things in, so she catches her sleeve on things. The little errors are put in to trick you, and yeah, they're, right. they're <laughs> sneaky. You know, and the AI will learn this, and they'll start putting it in. <laughs> well, so like I'm excited about the movement, uh, you know, moving away from a, this linear, long pipeline, which animation is typically known for, um, in kind of, uh, and then bringing more in uh, movement capture. Right. within animation, not, not necessarily motion capture suits, doing humans in that way, but kind of creating, creating shows where we're capturing and animating things, which is more kind of a play, a play between puppetry and keyframe and just kind of using the technologies in new ways so we can get faster turnaround, get the creative, you know, it's more, there's more of the creative on the screen rather than kind of going oh, down mm. necessarily always going down the traditional kind of route of animation. Mm. Well, it's but always going to be about great characters and, and... Yes, yeah, yeah. But how do, you, how do you get that across in a, different, in a different form of animation? And I think, I, think, I think over the next few years, we're going to see a lot of new 
exciting animation styles. Yeah, we, we've just been using um, Unreal to uh, create the worlds in Awesome Animals and Mini Me. So we've been using Unreal to design seven different tundras around the world where uh, kids do exercises with uh, Radzi, our presenter, um, and they were all in a studio in Maidenhead for a couple of weeks filming, but the whole backgrounds changed and it looked like he was in various part, different parts of the world. And we spent months creating that with Final Pixel. So like we'd have discussions about, you know, where do you want the sun, uh, that mountain, how many miles away do you want it to be? Uh, it was just, it just blew my mind. All these, yeah. and we created those environments. And, and then when you went into the studio with a virtual um, studio production, obviously it, it connects to the camera and it moves around. So when you're going left and right with the camera, the background moves when you're in the like studio. A like absolutely. So it, it's not green screen. It's actually moving around with you. And when you see that show, it, it launches in the autumn. Um, it's amazing. The bird, how many birds do you want to fly by? And it all looks totally real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we use and cheaper than flying the Arctic, isn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. And, the, and it's, it's great for carbon, but also <laughs> I think that, yeah. that we've got kids that for accessibility, they won't uh, they won't ever be able to do that. So right. they were really excited to be able to be filmed in these different parts of the world. And it was a really nice moment filming with them all. But it was all, you know, six months of creation in, in Unreal. It was, it was really exciting. Yeah, we used Unreal on Toad and Friends to do light and rendering, and um, uh, it's quite apt for a show that celebrates the outdoors. But we saved 600 tonnes of CO2 yeah. using Unreal over the CPU rendering, yeah. uh, which is uh, which is a bit of a winner. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But it was just it was the, the whole thing blew my mind actually. When you watch it, it's like he's actually on the beach, and it's a really interesting method of doing that and mm. I want to look into that a bit further you know and how, how we can do it again but yeah yeah right well that's about it I reckon no questions because you're all <laughs> hanging over aren't you so uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks again for Animation UK for their support now thank you very much and uh, have a good day